Welcome to the Nora Eccles Harrison Museum of Art. Thank you for joining us today. NEMA was founded in 1982. Since that time, our collection of primarily 20th and 21st century art has grown to over 5,000. At NEMA, we utilize these works of modern and contemporary art to cultivate learning and conversation about ideas that matter to the people of Utah and to Utah State University. We hope you enjoy your visit. Amanda Mortensen is an art student at Utah State University. She has a deep love of learning and unapologetically spends hours exploring historical rabbit holes. During her travels through Central America, Mortensen developed a deep love of Latin American culture. This exhibit was inspired by her interest in genealogy, ancient cultures, and her personal endeavors to recognize and deconstruct ingrained and systemic colonial narratives still pervasive in today's society. Now, let's make our way into the gallery. Just ahead, you will find the introduction. Oscillation, the changing view of self, explores the shifts in the way the indigenous peoples of Latin America viewed themselves from ancient times to the present. Consider for a moment the disconnect many Americans of European descent feel with regard to cultural heritage as a result of the traditions that were given up upon entrance into the United States in order to be accepted into society. How much greater then is that disconnect for those who were deprived of their heritage by conquistadors and tyrants? Additionally, the exhibition examines the impacts of Latin American search for native identity. If you will please follow me. We're definitely beginning our tour with a bang. This striking image by Latinx artist Yolanda Lopez sends a powerfully direct message about the true origins of Americans. When pilgrims and conquistadors alike arrived in the Americas, they were not met with the view of pristine virgin wildlands waiting to be tamed. What they discovered were lands that were already entirely peopled. Lopez gives an insightful look at the injustice of a displaced and marginalized people being told they don't belong. Recognizing this aspect of their native roots, many Latin Americans, including Latinx like Lopez, push back and assert that they were here first. Let's continue to our right. This next sculpture comes from a civilization considered to be the mother culture of Mesoamerica, the Olmecs. The stylized appearance of the Olmec head sculptures does not mean that artists back in the day lacked talent and we're just better at art now. Anyone who says stylized art is bad art has never attempted it. Artists have used stylization for centuries to communicate specific ideals through intentional stylistic choices. For example, in some cultures, a naked figure symbolized humility. The Olmec head sculptures are ruler portraits, which were very different from our modern understanding of portraiture. Ruler portraits were an effective means of conveying idealized messages about the ruler. Artists intentionally used culturally stylistic choices to portray the leader as they wished to be perceived. Each carving is distinctive, but many shared commonalities include proud or even fierce expressions and full facial features. Because the messaging of stylization is culturally specific, we can only make conjecture based on our limited understanding. However, from these works, we get a sense of the noble sense of self in this ancient indigenous culture. In stark contrast, Luis de Mena's Costa painting acts like a sort of periodic table of race, casting those of indigenous descent to the lowest order. Though these were mainly an export to soothe the ruffled feathers of class-conscious European aristocrats, Costa paintings fetishized the natives of the New World to such a degree that, eventually, many Latin Americans took pains to ensure their portraits portrayed them in acceptably affluent style. This is not unlike our highly edited, or stylized, Instagram photos today. Let's move on. During the mid-1800s, José Correa de Lima and many of his contemporaries recognized that indigenous peoples were sadly underrepresented in art. In an effort to remedy this injustice, Correa de Lima submitted a depiction of Simão Manuel Alves Juliano as part of a world-traveling exhibition. Juliano won international celebrity status for his heroic actions when the steamship Pernambucana crashed on a South Brazilian shore. Correa de Lima avoided the typical tropes associated with ethnic figures of the day, opting instead to depict Juliano in a style traditionally reserved for white elites. 
Although Correa de Lima detailed Juliano's courageous role during the wreck of Pernambucana in his catalog description, the placid image did not move his viewers to critically consider the significance of a black man portrayed in academic portraiture. Correa de Lima's portrait reinforced expectations of what it looked like to be a person of color. Let's step to the right, where we have The Two Fridas by Frida Kahlo. Kahlo infused her works with elements of incongruity, pairing beauty with horror, the attractive with the repulsive. In this dual self-portrait, Kahlo contrasts heartbreak and wholeness as well as European and mestizo heritage. Kahlo's use of blood dripping from the visibly torn heart into the lap of European Frida gives the viewer an unfiltered glimpse into the heartbreak and emotional pain she experienced during her first marriage to Diego Rivera. Beside her, clasping her hands, sits Mestizo Frida, dressed in the traditional Tijuana costume of her heritage and outwardly bearing an intact heart. This detail is of particular interest because it bears a resemblance to Kahlo's painting Frida and Diego Rivera, completed just after her marriage to Rivera, in which Kahlo and Rivera stand side by side, barely touching hands. Conversely, the figures in Frida's hold fast to one another. Kahlo conveys the internal fortitude she found to face the transition from European expectations of supportive, decorative wife and hobby artist to that of an independent mestizo woman who embraced her native culture, which she frequently included in her polarizing works. Please follow me to our next stop. One aspect of La Virgen de Guadalupe that appealed to the native population was her brown skin and dark hair, which was very much like their own. Depictions of the sun at her head, the moon at her feet, and stars on her reboso suggested a connection to Tonantzin, the earth and moon goddess of the Aztec pantheon. Infusing the goddess image with a bearing, pose, and expression consistent with Roman Catholic portrayals of the Virgin Mary was a routine evangelizing practice of the Roman Catholic Church. This calculated fusion of the European mother of God with the native goddess Tonantzin, though an effective means of conversion, also served to undermine traditional Christianity. Indigenous peoples were steadfast in their religious practices, and whispers of Tonantzin persisted in the colonial churches of the New World. In modern times, La Virgen de Guadalupe has become an icon of Mexican identity, and in spite of her enigmatic origin, she has transitioned from a justification for oppression to an emblem of the oppressed. The adjacent installation offers an interesting juxtaposition to the previous work. Delila Montoya's La Guadalupana, formerly titled El Guadalupano, operated as a reintroduction of La Virgen de Guadalupe to Europe as a testimony of the repercussions of colonialism and what it meant for those who had been colonized. Under Spanish rule, indigenous peoples suffered savage brutality and coercive religious conversion tactics. Colonists could purchase indigenous prisoners of war, and it was perfectly legal, with the caveat that they must convert them to Christianity, thereby saving them. Comparatively, Montoya's subject, Felix Martinez, was a veteran of the prison system, incarcerated for much of his life. He had just recently been released, but was arrested again, ostensibly under suspicion for a drive-by shooting. Though authorities knew Martinez was innocent, they believed he knew the identity of the shooter and held him under false pretenses in the hopes that he would capitulate and identify the culprit to clear his name and gain his freedom. What they failed to consider was that the gang Martinez belonged to would be able to get to him while he was in custody. He was murdered in his jail cell shortly after Montoya took this photo. This adds a haunting layer of meaning to the colonial undertones Montoya wished to convey in her work. Now, this sinner becomes an ancestor, being remembered at an ofrenda. And the viewer, presented with the syncretic colonial image of La Virgen de Guadalupe on Martinez's back, becomes implicated and is now the penitent. Please follow me to our next stop. Gustavo Artigas's works provide social commentary on issues such as art classification based on ethnic groups and materials toxicity. As part of his approach, he works collaboratively with communities to produce interactive works framed within recognizable concepts, in this case, sports. For his installation, Ball Game, Artigas reimagined the ancient Aztec ball game, Ulam Elitzli. The symbolism of the game varied among the civilizations of Mesoamerica, but prevailing commonalities included themes of good versus evil, life and death, elimination and rebirth, etc. 
At times in pre-Columbian memory, the game was employed as an alternative for battle or civil disputes, a competition, or the premier event of a celebration. Arcegas wanted to present a new perception of inner-city young men of color who were all too often subjected to othering stereotypes and stigma. He removed the net from a basketball hoop and affixed the hoop vertically in its place on the court. Stepping outside of social constructs, participants were free to work together to solve the challenges presented by the parameters of the game. With the simple shift of the hoop from horizontal to vertical, the game echoed the Mesoamerican ball game. By bringing the ancient game to an altered American basketball court, Arcegas establishes a synthesis of European-American and Latin American culture. He reveals the possibilities stemming from cultural legacy. Let's move on. After her travels in Europe, Tarsila do Amaral returned to Brazil feeling burdened by the Cubist movement, but believing it could be instrumental in developing something truly avant-garde. She began painting the flowers of the Amazon and the hills of the working class. She distilled her subjects, foregoing the sedate color palette typical of Cubist contemporaries, in favor of bold colors. Her efforts resulted in figural representations reduced to geometric shapes, filled in with separate and saturated colors, and boasting a completely new subject matter. Her works contained elements of Cubism, but unlike Pablo Picasso, Do Amaral did not shred and then reassemble her subject. Rather, she distilled her subject into an intact figure, full of life and vibrancy. One could argue that in defining her unique style, Do Amaral developed synthetic Cubism, a full decade before Picasso. The work we see here, Anthropophagy, epitomizes the philosophies laid forth in Amaral's then-husband Oswald de Andrade's Manifesto Anthropophago, or Anthropophagite Manifesto. He urged modernists to figuratively emulate the native Tupi. They believed they could harness their enemies' traits by consuming them. He asserted that Brazilian modernists must devour and digest foreign influences, transforming them into something of their own, something specifically Latin American. True to the cannibalism referenced in De Andrade's manifesto, Do Amaral melded European influences with indigenous heritage to produce something truly distinctive, Her works from the 1920s were instrumental in shaping native and international modernism. Our next and final stop is Codex Cannibalius Insulae by Enrique Chagoya. Chagoya's codices are a sort of anthropophagy in their own right, an amalgamation of historical and contemporary and native and colonial iconography. Recalling de Andrade's Manifesto Antropophago, Chagoya experimented with representations of cannibalism. Much like celebrated modern artists appropriated what they called primitive imagery with no understanding of them, Chagoya cannibalizes subject matters heretofore solely considered the property of Western modernism. He utilizes the iconography of pop culture to compel the viewer to consider the colonized oppressive sentiments contributing to cultural conflicts between the United States and Latin America. In Chagoya's codices, the viewer simultaneously finds comfort in the familiar imagery, as well as discomfiture in the discordant themes. In order to galvanize cross-cultural discourse, he intentionally disrupts the viewer's equilibrium concerning American culture in the same way we relate to the culture of Mesoamerica. Reflecting on his codices, Chagoya explained, I don't have solutions for the problems of the world. It would be too pretentious to think that art changes people's consciousness. But you could arrive to a point where your art is a departure for thinking, and the world changes through others' actions. That's my only hope with my work. We are so happy you could join us today at the Nora Eccles Harrison Museum of Art to view Oscillation, the Changing View of Self. We hope you enjoyed your visit. If you would like to learn more about the works included in this exhibit, please review the exhibition catalog available at the end of this presentation. Thank you.